who is the real reader in the reader? Here are movies we can learn from. Learning with Carl Ackerman, Dr. Carl Ackerman, an historian and an author and a philosopher person. And he has gone out to see this movie, uh, The Reader, and we are going to have a discussion about it. Um, you know, Carl is into Eastern Europe. And this is a story of Germany in 1947 at SEC about a young fellow who's on his way from high school. This never happened to me, by the way. On his way home from high school, he's 15 years old and he's not well and, and he's sick. He's got some kind of flu. And he stops in a, in, a, in a hallway, and he's obviously sick. And a woman comes by and helps him. And this woman is Kate Winslet. Mm, fantastic. And, um, and she ultimately mm, mm, has a summer of love with him. And she's at least twice his age. Okay. And um, it, it goes from there. It's epical. Over a lifetime, we find that this summer relationship between two people who are completely different in age and orientation. The one thing they had in common was a kind of a, an appreciation of literature, of reading. But that's, that's only touching it at the very front end, Carl. Um, why don't you tell our viewers the story of this really interesting movie? Well, you know, this couple has this, you know, very romantic affair. And uh, of course, as Jay mentioned, um, Kate Winslet is um, much older, twice his age. And the young boy is 15. He's still in high school. And so they have this, uh, you know, affair and he has to go back to his parents and his, you know, his, his dining room table. And he's kind of, you know, he doesn't know really what to make of this. And then the, at the same time, there are his friends in high school and they're going swimming. So, you know, you get the picture of this um, um, relationship and suddenly um, uh, the elderly woman uh, disappears and he has no understanding of why this woman has disappeared. And he's- Well, an you're, you're racing through it though. Let's talk well, about okay, the sweetness okay. of that summer. How, okay, did, well, the, how did this relationship evolve? I mean, it was so interesting that, you know, he was like beside himself, a 15-year-old kid and a woman um, who was quiet but strong, you know, it sort of turned in on herself person um, who, who gives him everything, but it gets to be transactional. It was a summer of reading. And at first, um, the transaction went, let me think, um, First, the transaction went sex first and reading second. And then she turned it around on him and she made him read first, reading for his sex. Um, and Kate Winslet is a beautiful woman, but I would say she's not beautiful in, in, in this movie. Um, the idea was to make her unbeautiful. And so here we have this relationship that every kid at 15 would love to have. <laughs> with this really exotic uh, woman who is like strange, um, and it, it it fulfills both of their needs in a transactional way. And what you don't realize at first is that the two of them, how what the odd couple really, truly the odd couple, are actually falling in love. They are in a romantic, as you said, Carl, romantic relationship. He can't tell his family. He can't tell all the women who come around, you know, in his high school class. He can't tell them why he's not seeing anybody because he's busy. After school, he has this <laughs> after school activity that any 15 year old would love to have. <laughs> so, you know, it, it gets closer and closer and they evolve. It's not just the sex and it's not just the reading. There's an evolution over that summer, and it changes his life. And we don't know for sure, but we think it changes her life too. Yeah. And um, Jay, just adding on to what you you know what you said with these wonderful descriptions, there were two scenes that really struck me from this early part of the film. You know, the first third of the film, and uh, the first was you know the reason he. Um, gets into sort of a sexual attachment with this woman is because he has to shovel coal um, in order to put it into a pail and, and that was used for heating and of course 
this is at just at the end of World War II, where you know basically that what will eventually become the European Union. They all sign off on this coal and steel agreement, you know, and and coal is the main source of heating um, for the houses. And you know, of course, Germany is just decrepit. And as the film goes on, you know, Germany greatly improves. So there's some, some there's a nice historical background to this. But the other thing is the the real sexual uh, meaning of this is is there's a scene and it could have been exactly with Dustin Hoffman who is another young man seduced by an older woman Mrs. Um, Robinson Mrs. Robinson right <laughs> with this you know this whole putting on the uh, stocking scene and um you know which just makes it that much more voluptuous you know and it's it's a great scene and um it really highlights their um their sexual relationship and it's just it's really wonderful and she by the way she is his teacher at the beginning because she is the expert in sex and um as you mentioned jay the the relationship then turns on its head because he becomes a little bit um or much more important because he is the person who can read to her and she you know she wants him to read to her and initially they have sex and then they have reading and then at the end, uh, you know, before she leaves, you know, kind of suspiciously and um, and we don't know why she leaves. Um, and uh, by the end, you know, she wants to have the reading done before the sex. So, you know, it's it's that's an interesting, uh, very interesting part of uh, about the first third of this movie. You know, I um, in, in preparing for this show, I, 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 I checked it up on. Uh on Google and YouTube, and uh, there was a Charlie Rose segment with uh, Kate uh, Winslet and the, the young German actor opposite her. Um, and it was a fantastic, you know, Charlie Rose had a magic. I, I tell you the truth, I've seen so many shows, I used to watch him all the time, seen so many shows where he recreated the work of art at his table. And you could see Kate Winslet and this young German fellow who was 18 at the time. It was a little after the movie was made. It was to celebrate the movie. And they were examining their roles retrospectively with the, you know, the script writer and, and the director. It was quite a, you know, if you get a chance, that's really worth seeing. <clears throat> and what you get is that Kate Winslet and this young man, and she's easily twice his age, are still in it together at Charlie Rose's table. You could see the magic that you saw in the movie at Charlie Rose's table. That's what Charlie Rose could do with people. That's, anyway, you know, yeah. he's, 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 he's absolutely wonderful. And I, you know, um, um, uh, you know, it's too bad he's still not on anymore because he, he was really masterful, not only in, in film, but also in literature. You know, I mean, he really could draw out the very best from people, you know, so yeah. there you go. Anyway, so here we are, and they're having this summer, and uh, they have a wrinkle or two because she is a streetcar cashier conductor person, uh, <laughs> and he follows her. He wants to know more about her. He doesn't know anything about her, um, and uh, and she doesn't like that. She doesn't want him to know more about her, and they have a little argument over it. But but what you know what happens, as you said, is that she kind of disappears. He goes to find her one day, and she's gone. And and then you begin seeing, you know, how attached he is to her. And um, you don't realize that at first. It's not just a, an afternoon gig. It's not just exploring sex and having this interesting transaction about reading. So what's the next chapter? There's a second chapter and a third chapter. What's, what's the, the next well, chapter? The, the second chapter, Jay, is that, you know, we see the young man as a law student. You know, and, um, you know, he's pursuing the law and he's going into classes and he has another romantic affair with a younger woman. Um, but he's pretty focused. I mean, he is a he is a guy who focuses on the law, focuses on his studies. And um, he finally enters this this special law class, which is, you know, dealing with morality, but specifically dealing with with. Uh, with uh, Nazi war crimes, and um, you know, uh, lucky this is in for the, the early class, 50s, they can early go 50s, and witness, right? Correct. In the early fifties, correct. A seminar type of class, big theater, you know, German theater classroom, but there's like three or four students. That's all. 
and a teacher who is very probative, just like you, um, you know, who who challenges them to deal with, um, you know, the, the Nazi thing. And what this tells us is that, you know, it didn't end in Nuremberg. It did not end in Nuremberg. Nuremberg was small potatoes because, in effect, I mean, that was, you know, it was globally, um, globally, you know, publicized. But in Germany, they had other trials. The Germans had other trials. And that went on for years. They were trying to come to grips, um, you know, with what happened in the war. This was an example of the intergenerational stress of what did you do during the war, Dad? You know, were you involved in this? Because it's horrible what happened, and I want to know. And then the parents wouldn't tell them. So this happened in the 50s. And so this whole class was an example of, you know, the students um, trying to figure out what their parents had done, trying to learn, study the morality, the ethics involved, what exactly was going on, how, how much engagement did the previous generation have in the Holocaust? Really important questions. And this class was all about that. So he was interested. He was... Um, he was into that. That's why he took the class. That's why he studied law. And that's why, and I'm getting to the, the moment of truth in the movie, that's why um, he was happy enough to go into the courtroom and observe the German war crimes trials that took place in the 50s. Tell us what happened. Well, you know, this is one of the most intriguing parts of the entire movie because um there are basically guards from auschwitz who are on trial and they're all women guards and um there are about six of them and uh they all have to go up and testify and they're asking the prosecutors are asking them sort of questions like what did you know and when did you know it and um you know there's there's one particular scene towards the end of the questioning um, where they're asked, the, the prisoners are asked to recount a time when the prisoners are in transit, and this is at the end of the war. And these uh, prisoners are locked up in a church, and the church, because of the, the uh, Allied bombing, catch, catches fire. Um, but the prison guards don't open it, and um, they want, want to know why they didn't open the church to let the prisoners out. And, um, you know, five of the six people who are, who are, who are not uh, Hannah, who's our, the main character, um, say, you know, um, uh, testify that they, you know, they were ordered to do this and et cetera, et cetera. And um, Hannah takes uh, full blame to this because, you know, she's, she's an interesting character because when they asked her why earlier on she became a member of the SS, she said, well, you know, I was looking for a good job, basically. I mean, it's as if, as if, you know, she was climbing the ranks. And um, you get the impression, um, even at this late date, that she doesn't understand the moral implications of what she did. I mean, she just doesn't get it. And when the prosecutors ask her, why didn't you open the church and allow these people to escape? And apparently um, several people did, hence you have an accounting of this. Um, she says, look, if they escaped, my job is a prison guard. I'm not allowed to let them escape. And that's her rationale. And then um, the other guards say to her, um, say, yes, she was the one um, who wrote this all up and uh, she was responsible and she gave us directions. And um, the prosecutor then turns to her. And that, and that and says, wasn't true. That was that was not true. Well, this is the this is the this is yeah. the gist of this moment is that yeah. she she can't possibly have been the person to write it up because she's illiterate. And that's why she that, that had, was the measure of it. If yeah. they could establish, there's a report of this that went back to the higher ups. And the report was, you know, we left them in the church to burn. OK. And and so um, the person who wrote the report was presumptively the leader of this group. And if they could paste it on her, then they get off with life sentences. She gets off with a heavier sentence. So Correct. the idea was to paste it on her. Go ahead. So she's, you know, she's, she's, um, she's illiterate. So she, you know, she, she really, really, um, 
um, shouldn't have been charged with this, but no one came forward. And of course, her young boyfriend, Michael, is sitting in the audience and he knows that she's illiterate because he has all these flashbacks. And he has these flashbacks that say, um, you know, um, why, you know why, why did she ask all these questions? And so it becomes particularly clear that, you know, she's illiterate and that Michael um, uh, has the urge and talks with his professor about going to testify. Um, but when he does so, um, he gets there, but then he decides not to do it for whatever reason. And so, you know, the, the, the question in this film is, you know, really who's guilty and, um, you know, who is, who is afraid and uh, who's guilty and who is afraid? Those are the two major questions I, I walked away with. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a really um, poignant moment because, you know, he could have saved her from getting a life. He could have saved her. He, he knew. Nobody else yeah. in the room knew uh, that she was getting pasted yeah. with this. Um, they were blaming her because they said she had written a report. He knew for a fact, and it was, you know, kind of a secret, right? He hadn't told anybody about his relationship with her. Um, if he stood up and said, wait a minute, you know, she's, she's uh, uh, illiterate. She can't write. Uh, she could never have written that report. He would have saved her. He, he was, in effect, a witness that the whole thing could have turned on him. So then you see him and you say, my God, what is going on in his mind? This was the turning point of the movie. So let me ask you. Why did he not say anything? Why did he not save her? He loved her. Why did he not save her? I, I, you know, I think that he, he I, I think that he basically um, was of the notion of being associated with this war criminal. I mean, you know, what she did was horrendous. And her test testimony if you watch him during the testimony his head is down he's holding his head but you know almost between his legs he's you know he's scarred by this and of course this is the woman he loved and he had no idea um what she was involved with and so you know i mean on the one hand you feel sorry for him but on the other hand you know if he truly had loved this woman he would have tried to um, safer. But, you know, the, the other part of this is that the other five guards are sitting there in the audience, too, knitting, talking freely. And, um, you know, the descriptions of the actions and, you know, of course, what she does in her testimony also, well, actually comes out in another guard's testimony, is that she would pick uh, people who were going to the concentration camp and save them. She picked like 10 people from every train or so or maybe every other train from every other day and she would you know and the other guards thought oh you know maybe she has some humanity in her and she's trying to save these people but the answer is no she just wanted these 10 people even if they were sickly or old to read to her and you know when she got done with them she'd send them back to what the nazis euphemistically call the selection process so they'd die anyway so um it is a really um, it, it is a really dark moment in that in that courtroom. And um, I, you know, I metaphorically, I was thinking that this is sort of Germany itself where, you know, crimes are being prosecuted. But are the general is a general population really come, coming to terms with it? And, you know, as the movie um, proceeds, Michael, um, the hero, and that's Robert Fiennes, um, uh, you know, not really a hero, the protagonist. Um, in this um, in this film, um, comes to grips with them himself and finally tells his daughter um, the story of this. Of Wait, this, before um... you go there. Before okay, you go there. Okay, again, I don't, I don't want to ruin it because we have another third to go. Okay, I'll stop. Okay, so we, you know, yes, of course, we have to get to that because that's the the uh, you know the the, the long term epical quality of the movie. But you know, there there's so much in that courtroom. Michael is the new Germany. He doesn't forgive what happened uh, during the war. Um, he is an immoral, ethical person studying in a, in, a, in a classroom where this is being examined closely, including arguments with other members of his class. He's, he's very, you know, the new Germany. And then you get, um, and you get her, and she is um, not educated in any way. She's just uh, sort of 
sort of a uh, primitive in her own way. She doesn't read or write, uh, but she has sensibilities. So she, you know, in a, in another time, if there hadn't been a war, she might have been much, much better off. The war caught her. The war caught her in that silly job. Silly is the wrong word. Um, and the war made made a fool of her somehow. And the women who pointed to her, who tried to paste her, who did paste her with that, they were they were mean, right? They they you know they wanted to ex escape from what was going to happen to her by being mean to her. They were they were the real Nazis. Um, they they were affirmatively mean. And the judge, who was so angry at her, the judge was, you know, out to punish her. Um, and his cross examination and the punishment that that court, three or four of them, um, visited upon her. That was pretty heavy duty. They were the new Germany. They were emerging as, um, you know, uh, as as the new um, prosecutors uh, of of the war crimes. You know, Nuremberg revisited. Nuremberg by the Germans, in a way, they were tougher uh, than Nuremberg was, because Nuremberg only tried, I think, 19 people, um, and uh, they didn't convict them all, and some of them walked, and some of them got put to death, and some of them ran away. But it, Nuremberg was not perfect. And these guys were trying to show they could do a better job, I think. Okay, and, and, then, um, and, and then her. I mean, she was, she was really an interesting character. Um, so all three of those, you know, the the women were so mean, the judge who was trying to vindicate Germany, the young kid who represented the new Germany, um, they all come from different places. Um, and her, she is, she is like flotsam. You know, she she has been victimized by everything and everybody around her, and she doesn't know what to do. She never knew what to do. Um, Okay, so it works out badly because they convict her and her friends get relatively minor sentences. She gets major, I forget, 20 years, was it? Yes. Um, it was a lifetime. And, um, and off she trundles to jail. And, um, and then their relationship begins to revitalize somehow. What happens? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that Michael... Because he's kept this hidden all the time, he you know he can't give a lot of his emotions away any longer. So you know he has a failed marriage. He has a wonderful daughter who you know it looks like doesn't want to see him very often. You know she goes off abroad, um, but they have a decent relationship. And he's he's not a, a bad guy. He's very kind, very thoughtful. It turns into Ralph Fiennes now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not we're not the fifteen year old kid anymore. We're right. Ralph Fiennes, who's a brilliant actor, one of my favorites. And it's very ironic that he played in, in Schindler's List as this totally brutal commandant in a, in a death camp. Uh, so here he is uh, in a completely different role. And you, can, you, know, you can't forget what he played in Schindler's List. <laughs> or, I mean, he played the villain in Schindler's List and also in Harry Potter. So, I mean, he just, he was, you know, and, and the, the, the portrayal, Jay, and I'm glad you brought this up. You know, um, I was talking earlier about this, is that, um, that his role in Schindler's List, he was the villain's villain. You can't get a worse depiction of a human being, um, even though Liam Neeson is trying to, Schindler is trying to defend him at one point. He's just horrible, I mean, with a capital H. And, you know, um, the interesting thing about just in terms of uh, cinematography here is, you know, throughout this film, is there, there, there are selections in the film where people look in the mirror and they're looking at themselves and they're dressing themselves and, you know, I always I always think of the song by Michael Jackson when I when I see people do this because you you know you got you got to fix the man in the mirror or the woman in the mirror first and <laughs> then you can go on. But it's you know so, you know I mean you can't get I mean you, you have to think of autobiographical stuff when you when you look in the mirror and things like this. So anyway, um, that's just an aside in terms of um, cinematography. But um, so what happens is that you know she goes into prison and you know her life looks pretty dismal and his life has not worked out all that well, although he. You know, he's a successful lawyer and he looks like he owns a construction firm for, you know, so, you know, he seems like he's uh, pretty, pretty well off. But then he, you know, he um, makes contact again with her 
and uh, writes her a letter. And um, then what he does, he, he begins to, and his, her lawyer um, contacts him. And what he begins, that's how they get, they get in touch with one another. And he begins to um, transcribe books to her. And it's interesting that the books that are mentioned, um, you know, there are a couple of books that are mentioned, but two stand out for me. One is the Odyssey, you know, this great trip abroad, but, you know, there's all sorts of hanky panky going on with, uh, you know, Odysseus's wife back in, in Greece and stuff like this. So that's one one. And then it, uh, it mentions, and, you know, this is the one that he, that you see him transcribe is by Anton Chekhov and it's a short story and it's the man with the little dog. And that's about an affair of a, of a Russian banker um, who comes down and has, you know, an affair with a woman who is in Odessa, I think, you know, which is, you know, being bombed right now by the Russians, but um, that's a whole nother story. Um, but um, uh, this is, this is really interesting. And so he transcribes all of these things. And I'm, I'm, uh, the ending I'm going to leave for you, Jay, but, but I, the, the, these, the, but what happens is he, he transcribes all these things. Eventually after 20 years, she's allowed to go free. The lawyer, her lawyer contacts him. He comes in and he says, you know, the first things he, he says to her really is, you know, what did you learn? And she says immediately, well, I learned how to read in here. And you know, she's quite proud of that. And so well, he's been sending her tapes, right? He, he's, right. Uh, he's transcribed uh, tapes, transcribed yeah. tapes of all these great books and sending her the book and the tape. Or maybe she gets the book out of the prison library, but she has the books. She has his tapes and she puts two and two together and decides she's got the time, <laughs> lots of time. So she learns how to read and write from one character, one letter in the alphabet at a time. She starts out from ground zero, and over the years she has actually read these books and, and learned how to be literate, which is quite something. And, and that's why the title of our review today is Who, who is the Real Reader um, in the Reader? Because you could say it was the 15-year-old boy who was reading to her for in sexual transactions, but you could also say, isn't it true, Carl? She's the real reader. She learns how to read. We have two readers here. We can't figure out which is the real reader. <laughs> and just to sort of, sort of, um, well, um, let Jay, I'll let you conclude with this. But I just have two things to two things to add to this: is that, you know, this was very much like a um, uh, a reader that I had uh, this whole film. This a reader that I had in my European history classes when you know, formerly I was teaching at, at Punahou School, and a Punahou student had interviewed after World War II, and she was someone who um, worked in a concentration camp. I mean, this is an actual true story, and um, she had to walk one of her best friends into the gas chambers, and the question was, you know, um, it, her name was Inga, and was Inga guilty? And because um, she was only like 14 at the time, but she, you know, if she had not done her job, her parents would have been killed and her family would have been killed. So it's it meant for a good discussion about, you know, who is to blame basically here. And um, uh, when I showed this to a World War II vet who happened to be my stepfather, Jerome Shore from Brooklyn, who, you know, like myself is Jewish and like UJ is Jewish, his his reaction to this is that if he had found her, they would have shot her. They would have shot her immediately um, after World War II because he was one of those, um, you know, commanders that went into Germany during World War II. And so, you know, he had a very different angle on this because he saw what was what was being done and what had been done and what the Nazis did. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing. And the you know the, this film humanizes everyone, but in the bigger picture, and I'm going to leave this with with you, Jay, because the, the, both the outcome with um, with Hannah and what happens when um, our protagonist goes to New York. And now I'm going to be quiet. Oh well, we're not we're not done yet, but that's you're right. We 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 must absolutely go to New York. We have to see this. Um, and so what she does is yes. uh, she learns to read in prison. He comes to see her when she's about to be released. And um, there's a, a moment, it's epical, it's after all these years, 20 years, how many, 25 uh, years, and now he's, he's, he's free again, he's not married, he has his daughter, um, and he, 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 he sits at a table with her, 
in the visiting section of the prison, maybe the cafeteria. And it's this moment of truth. Just like when he was watching her in the courtroom, this is another moment of truth in the movie. And you have to sit and think about exactly what does this mean? So they have this, um, what do you want to call it? This bland conversation and under the hood, all kinds of memories are popping up. It's a lifetime of feeling popping up, but they still can't talk to each other. It doesn't happen. She, she can't talk to him and he can't talk to her. And he leaves. He leaves the prison. And you think, well, maybe he, he says he's going to get in her apartment. But it's a, it's a dry romance. There's nothing left. He, 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 you know that he's not going to take care of her. She's old and frail, doesn't look so good. Uh, her health isn't so good. So it's not like he can pick up uh, from where he remembers her at age 15. That's gone, gone, gone. And she knows it too. So she stands on a pile of books, straps herself to the overhead, kicks the pile of books, very iconic, right? Uh, <clears throat> she kicks the pile of books and commits suicide before she is released. This is a really, you know, symbolic moment. The books that made her a reader, that made her literate, the books that expressed their romantic relationship over a lifetime, these books, she kicks them and dies. Fantastic. Now she, she had given him, or rather the warden of the prison gave him her things, including a letter, I think, of her wishes as to where this meager amount of money she had was going to go. And it was to, what, a survivor who now lives in New York on Park Avenue. Um, and he makes this trip to Park Avenue and meets with this woman. And she is wealthy beyond, beyond any expectation. She's really wealthy. And he meets with her in her in her home, uh, some kind of big apartment on Park Avenue. And that is another, that's the third extraordinary moment in the movie. Um, and they have this conversation. Can you remember, can you, you describe what is said in this conversation? I can vividly, because as you said, it's the third part. And it is a wonderful, wonderful part, because... This woman, who is actually the person I think that wrote the diary that um, or the transcript that made these prison guards go on trial, um, you know, she has pictures of her family in her Park Avenue apartment. And I, you know, and, and Jay, you and I have, have have seen these apartments, and they're quite nice. Um, but um, you know, she gives him no quarter. She's you know, she's not going to give this woman any solace, who is a concentration camp prisoner, and nor should she. Um, you know, I was I was all with her. Um, you know, nor should she. But it's interesting that he takes the money and he's and he um, uh, there there are actually Deutsche Marks and they're in this tin can. And um, the woman eventually takes the tin can because she had lost the tin can in the concentration camp. Someone stole it, which had her goods in it. She takes a tin can and she says, do the, what you want uh, with this money. And one of the only comical scenes in this entire movie um, except we would during their sexual relationship, which was kind of some some parts were pretty funny, um, is when he says to her, well, you know, shall I do what, you know, I could give this to some sort of Jewish organization, like perhaps something for Jewish literacy. And 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 she remarks back, she says, well, you know, Jews don't have a particular problem with literacy. And I, I just couldn't help but laugh, you know, because it, it was it was kind of a you know, a, a scene that made you laugh a little bit, you know, in this in this yeah. very dire um, comic, re comic relief. It, yeah. it, it was yeah. definitely that's exactly what it was, Jay. It was comic <laughs> relief. And uh, and, um, you know, he leaves. Um, then he leaves. But when he leaves New York, he goes back to his daughter and he takes his daughter in Germany to the where Hannah is buried. And he begins to tell his daughter. So he's coming back to life in a sense. She came back to life, I think, because she atoned for her deeds, that she knew that she couldn't be a civilized person, even as she accepted his generous apartment and job at a like at some sort of tailing tailor factory or something like this. Um, and uh, 
so you know it's there is redemption and i think the germans um to add add on to this a bit the germans have really redeemed themselves and um the japanese including with the recent um passing of um president abe i mean president abe went after a professor of Univer at university of hawaii a guy named immerman um who had talked about the korean uh, war crimes, uh, war brides, and the crimes against the Koreans during World War II. And the Japanese have really never come to grips with their war crimes against the Chinese or the Koreans and their death marches and you know, things like this. And whereas the Germans have, the Germans have. And uh, of course, you know, um, you know, it doesn't make me want to, um, you know, make cranes so that no one will use another atomic bomb in the world today. But the Germans are much more progressive about what they did. But my final thoughts, uh, Jay, uh, for you are this, is that the notion of responsibility is a key one today. And um, Donald Trump and the people around him who have uh, committed the attempt, attempted coup in America, um, you know, we should prosecute them like the Germans prosecuted the Nazis. I mean, because this was an attack on our basic democratic institutions. I, and I think those people are criminals. Of course, and as the prosecutor said in this film, you need to prosecute them using the law because the law is critical. And you can't just say they were immoral, you have to, which they were, of course, but you have to say that, you know, that they, they committed crimes. And I think they did commit crimes against the Constitution, against our capital, and against our democracy. So anyway, I had to add that because I I, I think oh, that, you know, I'm, Democrat or Republican, you, you may be, but, you know, those those were pretty heinous oh, crimes. I, I think Chinese the judge people. was really saying, and the movie was really saying, even though this took place, uh, you know, I think the movie was made in 2018 or so, um, you know, before we got to insurrections and the like, he was really saying that, um, you know, the, the whole uh, Third Reich would not have happened had, had they followed the law. Um, and he was making a, a comparison um, between the two countries and expressing concern where wherever you find a, an autocratic arrangement where uh, people are not following the rule of law. So it was very powerful in that regard. I think the one thing that, that, that threw me off, let me offer this thought, is that we saw the war through her eyes. She was a very uh, sympathetic person. She was trying, you know, but not succeeding, trying to find a way to live on this planet, um, to have, um, you know, romantic relation, relations. She was trying to find a way to recover, to redeem herself through most of her life. And you saw the war through her eyes, and you were, I was sympathetic. But we forgot about the women in the church uh, the people who were burned alive, we forgot in this movie, we forgot about the victims of the Holocaust. And it's, it's, um, you have to remember that. You have, to, you have to go back and reach for that view of it also to fully appreciate this movie. And Jay, just to add one thing, and I want to go back to my historical seminar. The thing about Inga is that this Punahou student interviews her, and it was like taken from the 1970s before, of course, I was at Punahou. And um, when they asked Inga at the very end, even after she talked about how she had to walk her best friend to the gas chambers, how there was such, you know, mass killing in the in the concentration camps, the last question was, well, you know, did Hitler do any good? And she said, oh, yes. And then she became very effusive about Adolf Hitler and all the jobs he provided and all these sort of things. And, you know, I, you know, <laughs> that may be very true, but to be That's effusive about peculiar is what it is after all these years. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's 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 an, an indication, and I I think Hannah fit into that category. I mean, I think she, you know, when she was talking about um at, at during the testimony about why she went into the SS, she described it as if you were getting a job, you know, a, you you were working at McDonald's and you got a better job at Walmart or something, you know. I mean, uh, those could be reversed, of course, I know, but you know, it's it it was it was really uncanny, and it gave you. It gave you a sense of the of the Holocaust that, um, besides you know, um, watching uh, specific Holocaust films like Night and Fog, um, this was more like a film like Schindler's List. And of course, the best film that I've ever seen about youth um, and what happens to a young person um, during the Holocaust and during 
uh, World War II is that Agnesia Holland film, Europa, Europa, which remains one of my favorite films of all time. Well, thank you, Carl. Um, you know, one thing is uh, I, I keep wondering when I, when I hear about anti-Semitism or uh, Holocaust deniers, uh, how ignorant they, they must be about the Holocaust. We've had 70 years of art, uh, of, of scholarship uh, about what happened in those days. And we have films like this that keep on being made, you know, that, uh, that keep on reminding us what was going on. Brutality is the word. Not only were they killed, they were killed in the most brutal possible ways. It was heartless every damn time. And, and um, you know, it happened all over Europe, wherever the Germans were, or they unleashed this kind of brutality. And for anyone not to know about that after 70 years of art and history and scholarship in all the media, every media you can think of, and then to deny that it happened, this is really, really, really incredible. And I, uh, I walk around with a, with a sense of uh, how in the world could they have missed this story? So anyway, uh, just a thought. Uh, what, what is your rating of this film hmm, on a scale of one to 10, Carl? Well, as I just mentioned, because I, I think it, it was, well, I'll, I'll just say right out, it's a 10, uh, because I just thought that it was, illuminating and um it's one of the films that i've seen probably the only well one of the only films i've seen that really directly asks the question the great uh, 19th century chernovshevsky's question you know who is to blame and what is to be done um you know and and um you know it's it's a it it doesn't knock you over the head with this but it poses a lot of questions and um, the notion of morality in your daily life, I think, comes out strongly in this film and how you conduct yourself as a, as a human being. And it's interesting, the professor seems to have, that teaches a law class, seems to have a pretty good handle on this, you know, and he kind of... Oh, has, you, you, you know, mean done, Michael's professor in the class? Yeah, Michael's class professor in the, in the class. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. seems to be someone who has thought about these things you know, for years and come to grips with them. And, and um, you know, I don't want to put too much on it because, you know, I don't know what the, what the screenwriter was thinking about him, but, you know, I hope I'm not wrong about this. Well, but uh, but he seems like he seems like, yeah. Unanswered in the movie. Yeah, and, and I would uh, recommend it to everyone. In fact, Jay, I, I went to one of my best friends here in Hawaii and I said to him, man, do I have a film for you? And he goes, oh, you know, Carl, I think I saw the film. And I, I said, am I the only person that saw this just because, Jay Fidel and his, one of his wonderful suggestions told me about this, and I went and, re <laughs> and went and immediately watched it. Well, you know, we we've been asking for years what exactly happened in Germany that they would have allowed Adolf Hitler to, to get into power. Uh, what was the process by which he um, acceded to that power? Um, and um, we don't really have an answer. We know that there is redemption in the country, and and they are uh, much more moral now, although there are. Some of them who are not, some of them are still Nazis. And it's always disturbing to see that. And we are disturbed, and many Germans are disturbed to see that. Um, but, but we need to understand not only what happened in Germany, but what happens to people in that environment, in that, in that scenario. This movie helps us to understand. Um, it's not like getting a job at Walmart. No, it's not. Thank you, Carl. Carl Ackerman, a historian. Um, a professor, a, a, a reader, and an author. Wow, great to have you on the show to talk about movies. We will do it again, I promise. Jay Fidel, thank you very much. And as your audience knows, if they've ever watched us together, I think that you're the um, super mensch, the ultra mensch, <laughs> the you. uber mensch, uber mensch. Let's see, it's a little bit German, uber mensch. <laughs> Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.